one, go. All right. Kia ora everyone, good evening. Um, lovely to uh, to be here tonight if, uh, if I can't uh, actually see you. Uh, my name is, is Melanie Bruges. I'm one of the presenters uh, at uh, Stardom Observatory and uh, it is my pleasure to, to be doing tonight's practical astronomy uh, tour of uh, the spring sky. I volunteered to do tonight's show for you uh, many uh, months ago, well before Auckland was in lockdown. Um, I'm a, as I say, a presenter at Stardome, a uh, planetarium presenter, and uh, tonight is, well, today, the 20th of September, is actually uh, my 20th anniversary of working at Stardome, and so I thought it'd be a really great idea if I volunteered to operate the planetarium while Andrew talked about the spring sky. Um, now, unfortunately, as things have uh, worked out, of course, we're not at Stardome tonight. But I still thought it would be nice uh, to uh, to do something uh, with the Astronomical Society. So here I am, and uh, you know, just got someone uh, different to talk about uh, the night sky than what was originally planned. But anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, hopefully uh, you'll in, enjoy uh, my take on it. Normally, of course, having a multi-million dollar planetarium behind me um, makes things a lot easier. Uh, so uh, tonight, instead, we've got Stellarium. Uh, free planetarium software, so we'll see how we go, uh, but um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, just a few credits, just a, a shout out to all the other presenters at Stardome uh, who might be watching, who chipped in with uh, some um, with some suggestions. And also tonight, I'll be trying to put in as much uh, te reo Māori as I can. Uh, of course, we've just had uh, Te Weki o Te Reo, uh, so Māori Language Week, and um, I'm no... Māori language expert, but uh, what I can put in, I have. Uh, and if you're interested in any more uh, Māori astronomy, I really recommend uh, Dr. Rangi Matamua's book there. I've put a picture up. You can have a look uh, at it at your leisure. Uh, but what I thought I would uh, cover tonight um, is, well, quite a few things. So it's actually it's a big week okay we've uh, we've got the vernal equinox so happy vernal equinox everyone congratulations on passing through the center of the sun's uh, disc the sun is directly above the equator uh, not sure if you felt that today but um anyway so spring is finally on its way you can finally actually say happy spring to people uh, and uh, hopefully you haven't been saying it since the first of september because we know that this is the the real marker so uh, tomorrow uh, is uh, the vernal equinox. Um, tonight I thought I'd have a look at some, some satellites, um, both natural and man-made. Uh, we'll cover off our planets that are in the sky at the moment because they're just putting on such a great show. Have a look at some of our constellations, how to find them, um, a little bit about why they're interesting, and uh, have a look at some star clusters and other fun things to look at. So. So yeah, that, that is the plan. So let's start off uh, with our natural satellite, uh, the moon, Marama. And um, I put in the intro there, satellites, friend or foe. Now, this chart of when the moon is going to be uh, full um, might be useful for you in terms of being able to go out and look specifically for the full moon, but it also uh, might be so that you can actively avoid the full moon. Right, so when the moon is up and full, obviously it makes it quite difficult to look at through a, a telescope and uh, tends to wash out everything else. So uh, I've put these dates up here and you can choose whether you, uh, you avoid it or, or look out for it. Full moon tomorrow. Uh, and then our next one is, one is on the 21st of October. And I've, I've especially noticed this, uh, noted this, I should say, because that is the peak um, of the Orionid. So anyone who was really keen to uh, to have a look for the uh, meteor shower that tends to be around, usually it's around Labor weekend um, each year. Uh, unfortunately, this is not going to be your year. The moon will be full from sunset to uh, sunrise, uh, and uh, it's just not going to be a great one. But uh, in uh, this spring period, uh, just a, another noteworthy occasion is our partial lunar eclipse, which will be visible from Auckland on the 19th of November. 
Now, I always enjoy uh, these because it's just an easy way to impress friends and family, right, uh, to go out and uh, demonstrate the moon going slightly pinky uh, reddish in the sky. Those of you who missed that great total lunar eclipse earlier in the year might want to go out and have a look for this one. Uh, it's not completely full, but as you can see there from the diagram uh, just below, we're really only missing that tiny little bit. So uh, it should put on quite a good show if, um, if the weather holds out. So have a look for that on the 19th of November. Okay, so that's our, our uh, Earth's natural satellite, uh, but um, of course we've got man-made ones as well. I know this isn't specifically spring sky related, but um, I haven't seen a talk on this uh, recently, so I just wanted to do a shout out about heavens above and the ability to look out for these man-made satellites uh, if you want to. Now again, friend or foe, uh, if you are an astrophotographer in particular, you're probably going to want to use this to avoid man-made satellites and then passing over the sky in the area that you're interested in looking at. But for the rest of us, um, it's just another fun thing to do, um, you know, something something to try over the spring um, evenings uh, is to go onto Heavens Above in advance, make sure you put in your location, that's a top tip, okay, make sure you put in Auckland, uh, the date that you want, and it'll give you this really easy list here of all the bright satellites. I've um, limited it to satellites of um, third mag um, magnitude three and um, below, uh, but um, you can see here all of the nice satellites that'll be going over, and uh, it tells you where, when, and if you are interested in one in particular, you can click on it to see a picture of that satellite, and also download a map much bigger than the thumbnail I've put here, just to, to give you an idea, but uh, you can you can really see exactly where that satellite's going to go uh, and uh, and just spot them, so nice and fun. And so if you've missed out on the whole controversy as to why uh, satellites, and in particular these ones here, these Starlink satellites, are uh, a bit of a, um, well, I could say, not everyone's a fan. Um, I've actually got, so this here, this, this list, uh, of satellites is for tonight, so September the 20th, as you can see there. Um, I've just also um, put up here a list of our satellites on the 25th, so only in a few nights time. Uh, you can see that the number of satellites, and in particular these um, Starlink satellites, um, is you know it just quadruples okay so um, and again these are only the the brighter satellites of uh, third magnitude or brighter so and um, so really really bright to date so a check out uh, the the number of Starlink satellites for today uh, we have um, 1740 Starlink satellites in space but the plan for Starlink um, in its generation two phase is to go for uh, nearly 30,000. It's actually 29,988 satellites in orbit. So it's just going to completely uh, change the night sky. Now, I'm not going to pass any judgment on that here. That's uh, another another talk maybe for somebody else. But um, but you can, you can just see uh, the difference uh, that those Starlink satellites make. Um, when they are are in the sky, so either have a have a look out for them or, or or know when they're there so you can avoid them. Okay, so let's uh, move on to our our planets uh, that are in the sky at the moment. Now, I'm sure everyone has seen Venus, so I'm not going to spend uh, any time really on this, apart from to say that at the moment, this is uh, tonight. You can see that Venus is. Uh, amongst you know the brightest that it, it gets. So we've got the magnitude for each item listed on the right here um, with the, the, the lower the number, of course, the, the brighter it is. So there's a bit of a range depending on where Earth and Venus are in their orbits as to how bright this planet will be. And uh, tonight we're at the higher -ish end of the scale, so um, uh, pretty nice. But Venus isn't a great telescope uh, object or binocular object. I wouldn't recommend it for that. Um, you know, this that cloud uh, cover there makes it not too interesting and, and it doesn't have any satellites to, of its own to have a look at. As opposed to our next couple of planets, of course, we have uh, Jupiter, 
And uh, this is looking straight up now. So I've I've put in the um, the grid there so that you can see um, the um, uh, the zenith there, looking straight up. Uh, next to it, we have Jupiter, and uh, Jupiter is just it's one of the objects that um, you know get people coming back to start home to look through the telescopes all the time. I, I tried my best to use Stellarium to to show what uh, Jupiter looks like through a telescope. I think I did an okay job of Jupiter, but not so much uh, it, its moons. And Jupiter has 79 moons. Uh, not that you'll see those uh, through even uh, you know, a larger telescope, uh, but you can hope to see a couple of the larger ones depending on where they are in their orbits. Uh, now, Jupiter is uh, at uh, the, again, very, very um, um, high brightness at the moment, so it's, it's close to the brightest that it, uh, it gets. Uh, and the reason for that actually um, comes back to, if I jump back to uh, that um, diagram I showed uh, earlier of, of you are here, um, Earth and Jupiter are quite close in their, uh, in their orbits around the sun. So that's, uh, that's helping Jupiter to appear really quite bright in the sky at the moment. Okay, um, same, but not quite so much uh, for Saturn. Okay, Saturn is absolutely spectacular. And again, I uh, did a better job with Stellarium there of showing uh, what uh, you might expect to see through uh, a 10 or 12 inch uh, Dobsonian telescope. Um, looking really, really good. It's not it's not at its brightest, uh, but it is a good time to see Saturn because um, as you can see there, the, the view that we have of it uh, shows the, the rings of Saturn quite well. So uh, they're on a really nice angle tilted uh, in, um, in, in our perspective from Earth. And this is not always the case. As you're probably aware, those rings, uh, they're very wide, as you can see, going around Saturn there, 300 thousand kilometers across uh, but they're only 80 meters deep okay and of course they're not solid they're actually made up of these millions of bits of rock and ice that are racing around Saturn in their own uh, individual orbits uh, but because those rings are only 80 meters deep that's that's next to nothing um, for a telescope and so every 13 to 15 years or so those um, um, the Earth's um, position around the sun uh, will mean that uh, we, we are on the same plane as the rings and they will seem to completely disappear. And so uh, the last time this happened was actually in, in 2009. This was this image I've got here is from the time prior to that. Um, but um, you can see that uh, when they go edge on, it just they just completely disappear. So that won't happen until March 2025, but I'm just giving you advance warning now uh, to get in uh, before it happens uh, and uh, and they disappear for a while. Also, side note uh, that they will disappear uh, probably permanently in about 300 million years, but plenty of time uh, to get in before that is an issue. All right, so those are our, our planets, uh, our absolute must-sees for, uh, for the skies in the next couple of weeks. And uh, we'll return now to our constellations. We're going to return to where we... Uh, left off with Andrew's last show, uh, he ended up with uh, uh, Capricornus. And so Saturn and Jupiter are in Capricornus at the moment. Um, and uh, just to refresh everyone, the easiest uh, way uh, to look for Capricornus is to look for basically a... Um, a great big arrowhead in the sky, which I'm going to uh, to draw here, uh, remembering that of course Saturn and Jupiter move, so they uh, so don't use them for any kind of reference point in finding Capricornus. But you you sort of draw all those stars uh, together, uh, and what have you got? You've got a goatfish, obviously. Uh, so um, that is uh, Capricornus, and how we find that in the sky. Now, why would you find Capricornus? Well, those of you who've got uh, maybe a um, a more powerful telescope um, might want to have a look out for uh, M30 globular cluster at magnitude 7.7. It's uh, it's going to be I would have thought quite tricky, but uh, give it a go uh, and I'd be interested to see any photographs anyone's uh, got of that. It's up nice and high at the moment, so it's um, uh, one of the best times of the year for for seeing this, particularly earlier on in the in the evening. 
Okay, so um, really dominant in this part of the sky at the moment uh, is an, an asterism uh, known as the square of Pegasus. So it's part of the constellation of Pegasus, the horse, as you might expect. They're going down um, from Capricorn towards the uh, uh, towards the horizon. Have a look for four bright stars uh, that make a square. And um, and I say you know square in very loose terms, of course, because uh, you know these are our constellations, and and a little bit of creativity is required. But this is uh, what we're looking for. And down here, a bit of a, a square, uh, remembering that uh, the Stellarium view of the night sky is a little bit distorted for the flat screen. So it looks a bit more like a square in the, in the real sky than it, than it does here. Um, but from the square, the square of Pegasus, we're going to make the horse of Pegasus. Uh, the good news uh, is that uh, unlike most constellations of the night sky, this one is actually the right way around for us here in the Southern Hemisphere. So we don't have to contend with the, the whole flipping it uh, issue. Uh, bad news, it still doesn't really look like a horse. So uh, you'll need your imagination. That's actually probably as good a horse as I would draw stars or no stars. But uh, this is what we're looking for. So here is his Pegasus. And again, those of you uh, with telescopes, um, I want to have a look for uh, M15 Pegasus cluster just off the, the nose of the horse there. Uh, this will, again, be the, the best time for it as it's um, at its highest point towards the north in the sky uh, earlier on in uh, in the spring. Okay, so there's Pegasus. Um, next to Pegasus, just to the, the left, we have a really a small distinctive cluster of stars. Now, these very frequently get pointed out in the planetarium um, by people who, who notice them. They're a really tight uh, group of stars. Now, depending on the resolution of your screen, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see them at all. Uh, but um, they're... Uh, let me go backwards. Try that again. There's our, um, there's our asterism, our, our constellation, actually, this one. Uh, it is supposed to be a dolphin. This is dolphins. Okay, so um, really small, really tricky to to, um, to see in here, but to give it a go in the real night sky, again, it's at its highest point, so a good time for, for picking it out. In between Delphinus and uh, Pegasus, uh, we have a constellation that actually technically is even smaller than, than Delphinus, uh, and yet uh, not the smallest constellation of them all. Everyone knows what the smallest constellation of the night sky is, right? I'm sure you do. If not, don't worry, we'll get to that uh, later on. Uh, but uh, here's another horse for uh, horse fans. Again, going to really struggle uh, to see a horse in that group of stars, but um, uh, but just worth pointing it out in between in between those two. Uh, to the left of Delphinus, we have, you can see that bright star there, Altair. Okay, Altair is marked, and uh, that's a really good marker star for um, picking out our next constellation, which uh, actually, again, does look a little bit like the thing that uh, that it's meant to, and that is as uh, an eagle aquila. So, again, I've tried to draw them together before bringing in our picture uh, of a nice big eagle across the sky. So that's a really noticeable constellation, a really good one to have a look for, um, because it's quite easy to see that shape, and it's quite large uh, across the sky. Hey, below Aquila, we have a really bright star, Vega. Um, many of you will be familiar with as part of um, the constellation of Lyra. Okay, and then lastly, I've just put up here is a, a wayfinder. Up here we have Aquarius. Aquarius, the water bearer, who is going to be the left of our next slide, uh, which uh, is the same part of the sky. So we'll still uh, stick to looking towards the northern sky, uh, but just a little bit later on in the evening. So you can see here that uh, this is uh, 9, 9.20 uh, on, in October. 
Okay, so we're just going to uh, move on a little bit to we've got 10.30. So as we move on to 10.30 in the sky, you can see Aquarius moving on over to, uh, to uh, drifting towards the west or appearing to drift towards the west. And our great square of Pegasus still here um, above the horizon. Okay, you can see how that perspective again of Pegasus has changed a little bit um, just because of, um, of the perspective of the screen. But it is still a big square in the sky. So what we're looking for to the right of Pegasus uh, is a faint but um, really interesting uh, stretch of stars that go right across the sky, up and then down. Okay, now again, it might be tricky to see depending on the resolution of your screen, uh, but it's quite a distinctive uh, shape in the sky, and that is going to be Pisces, uh, the fish. Doesn't look like uh, fish at all, of course, um, but um, according to the the Greek myth, these were two fish that were actually um, the goddess of of love, Venus, and her son Cupid. They were um, trying to escape a horrible uh, god, Typhon, uh, and the only way they could do that was by jump, jumping into a, a river that was filled with millions of fish. Uh, so, so they turned themselves into fish, transformed themselves, jumped into the river, and uh, just to make sure they didn't lose each other, they tied their tails together with a piece of, of ribbon uh, so, so they weren't separated for long. Now, it's one of those kind of Greek myth stories where you kind of had to be there. It doesn't really um, make sense. But anyway, that's why we've got Pisces and our, and our two fish tied together. Uh, and... Um, you might have noticed that uh, of course Pisces is one of our signs of the zodiac and it's uh, right next to Aquarius, another sign of the zodiac. So this here is uh, the plane that our sun, the moon uh, and uh, the eight or well, the seven planets that we can see from Earth travel across in the sky and uh, it's working out all right. As you can see here, Jupiter is just there. So if the uh, zodiac constellations are going across the sky like this, then this must uh, be another sign of the zodiac. And these two bright stars here are the ones that help us find uh, the constellation of Aries the Ram. Okay, so Aries the Ram, a small and, and otherwise uh, not so bright constellation, but th those two do help us find it. Just below uh, Aries, uh, we have Triangulum. And triangulum is always a bit of a laugh, like three stars that make a triangle. I mean, you could do that with really any three stars uh, of uh, of the night sky. But um, if I take it away, you can see those those three there just below Aries. And the reason why you would find triangulum is because just between it and Pisces, uh, we have a, another deep sky object, another tricky one, but uh, worth uh, having a go at. A triangulum galaxy, so magnitude 6.06. .06. It's again not an easy one, but um, it is quite close to the horizon there, so it uh, can be quite a bit of a challenge, but uh, worth giving it a go um, while you're in lockdown. And uh, um, you can uh, you can stay out a little bit longer than usual. All right, uh, just beneath Pisces and Triangulum, we have three. Uh, quite distinct stars here that are going to help us find another constellation, a very well-known one, uh, of course, Andromeda. Now, the most popular question I've had in 20 uh, years of working at Stardome, the, the most common, the most popular one is, can you show me a picture of a black hole? But the second most common one uh, is, where is the Andromeda galaxy? And I think that's just because of uh, the um, the PR that the Andromeda galaxy gets from a northern hemisphere friends where uh, it's a little bit higher above the horizon and well, it's a lot higher above the horizon. It's much easier to see. But for us, this is your best chance. Okay, so throughout October and early November, have a look for it just uh, beneath those three stars that um, make up Andromeda. So I'll just show you them again. Okay, so this is um, Almac, this is Mirac, and then this one here um, is Alpharetz. Now, Alpharetz I've already used in making up the Great Square of Pegasus, but technically that star is actually in the constellation of Andromeda. So little uh, 
Um, little fun fact to know about that one. So have a look for Andromeda if you're keen to see the Andromeda galaxy. That is where we are looking. And uh, if uh, if you're successful, okay, if you're away, from, well away from city lights, well away from anything remotely high on the horizon, um, then uh, you may be rewarded with one of the most beautiful objects that uh, you can possibly see. All right. So let's, oh yes, and I've just put up here. So I'm not going to talk about this for now. I'm going to save this uh, for uh, for our summer sky, but some of you may have already noticed that it's there. We're still in our plane of the um, of uh, the zodiac. So uh, the, that there is, of course, a group of stars known as uh, the Pleiades or Matariki, uh, and they're in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. But I guess I'm not going to to talk about that one just here. Instead, we're going to uh, pivot a little bit. So we're going to move from the north. Uh, we're going to move around now towards our western sky and have a look at what uh, is actually setting. So I know that these were covered off a, uh, a little bit in the last tour of uh, the night sky, but they're so great. I'm just going to, to do them quickly now as well. Uh, here you can... Uh, you can quite clearly see, even without uh, too much help, uh, a red supergiant star that is a little bit like all the others, other stars that you can see in the sky, uh, and that is, of course, Antares or Rehua. Uh, now, according to the Māori, um, Rehua here uh, is actually um, a star married to the uh, uh, to the star Matariki, or the brightest star of the the group of stars known as Matariki uh, that we just we saw in the last slide, which is, of course, in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Now, Rehua uh, and, uh, and Matariki, they're married like many uh, married couples, particularly in lockdown. They are no longer speaking to each other, and so it's actually not possible to see Rehua and Matariki in the sky at the same time. So, um, so here I've moved us back into the early hours, of, uh, sorry, the, the earlier evening as opposed to, to much later as we were before, uh, and just before Rehua sets and Matariki comes up. But Antares uh, is um, better known in Western astronomy as the, the marker of the constellation of uh, Scorpius, uh, the Scorpion. Now, I like to say that it's actually the heart of the Scorpion. So these three stars here making up the body of the Scorpion, the head down here, and then the tail coming up and around. Um, but according to uh, Stellarium, uh, it's actually part of the uh, the head of the scorpion. So if you can you can see that just faintly there, um, we've still got. It, it's actually a little bit uh, different to how I would show it. Um, I would say the head's down here and the claws come out there, but um, they actually got the claw coming down here instead. Um, Regardless, the group of stars that you're really going to want to look for are these ones up here. This nice, beautiful hook in the sky. One of the common uh, mistakes that we get in the planetarium in particular for people who are looking for this constellation uh, is that they pick out a beautiful curl of stars that are just off uh, the top of the screen here just at the top you might be able to see them uh, they can be a little bit uh, tricky a little bit confusing and um, they are a, a constellation in their own right that is corona australis and that's not what we want um, of course um, the best way to check that you've got the right curl of stars in the sky is to have a look for uh, Antares uh, and that will tell you that you've got the body of of the scorpion as well okay now if you're not set on uh, finding a scorpion in the sky another way that you might like to do it is of course to have a look for uh, the fish hook of Maui Te Matawa Maui uh, and that's a really beautiful way to see it in the night sky with uh, Rehua and Tares that um, is actually said to be a uh, drop of uh, the blood of Maui that he used to put on his hook to bait the hook and to catch the North Island of uh, New Zealand. So Te Ika Maui was caught using a drop of Maui's blood. So another really nice way to see that uh, that group of stars, particularly at this time of the year, uh, as the evening, um, as the early evening be uh, begins to come to an end, getting into the late evening, uh, the the um, 
Bishop is just on the, the top of the horizon and uh, looks spectacular. Okay, so back uh, to, to Scorpius. Now, below Scorpius, we have uh, three distinct stars here on the horizon. Uh, and uh, these nowadays are actually part of uh, Libra, the scales uh, in um, the official 88 constellations. But uh, back in the day, uh, for uh, some of our ancient um, Babylonians, they considered those stars actually to be part of Scorpius. So they were his claws uh, coming down like that. And so for that reason, actually, they came down to here and to here. For that reason, uh, these two stars uh, in um, Arabic are called uh, the uh, the southern claw of the scorpion and the northern claw of the scorpion. And in Arabic, uh, that should sound something a little bit like Zubinel Janubi and Zubinel Shamali. So I apologize to everyone who does speak uh, Arabic properly. But um, uh, there we go. That's uh, They're now considered part of Libra, as I say, but, um, but their names actually make sense more closely related to, to Scorpius. Okay, now going back uh, to Scorpius, sorry I deviated a little bit there, there are a lot of reasons why at the moment you would want to have a look uh, at this part of the sky. There's any uh, time that uh, Scorpius is in the sky, uh, there is just this huge number of beautiful objects that uh, you can have a look at. You can see that they're really quite achievable there. Um, northern jewel box there at only 2.6 um, magnitude. A shout out to John Rowe if he's um, watching tonight. Another uh, Stardome presenter uh, who suggested this one. Um, it's a, a really good object to have a look at. Um, you can see those really vibrant colours uh, of, um, of the blue stars in particular. And those of you with uh, some... Uh, Slightly more high spec tech can have a look for M80 uh, globular cluster as well. Okay, next up, um, we'll have a look at Sagittarius. Now, Sagittarius uh, is a bit of a tricky one. Um, when I'm looking for Sagittarius, there, there are a few ways of doing it. The way that I like to do it is to remember that Sagittarius is a half uh, way well, a centaur who is. Um, pulling back an arrow in his bow, trying to kill the scorpion. Okay, Sagittarius hates Scorpius. He hates Scorpius because Scorpius in the story has just killed Sagittarius's best friend, the constellation of Orion. So uh, Sagittarius is out for revenge. And so what I do is I take Antares and I go towards the zenith. So I try and go straight up and have a look for this arrow in the sky. Okay, now it's not it's not complete. It's not everything, but I find it is better than um, you know looking for what you're supposed to see, uh, which is the centaur, complicated centaur pulling back his arrow and his bow. Anyway, um, another way uh, that a lot of people, particularly in New Zealand, uh, like to do it is to have a look for something called the teapot. Now, this is not to be confused with the pot. That's something. Uh, uh, altogether different, but um, it does look a, a, quite a bit like a teapot, although an upside down one uh, from this perspective. And what's really good about this asterism uh, is that you can't really see it, unfortunately, in here, but in a really beautiful dark night sky or in the planetarium, uh, you can see that tr um, real trail of the, the Milky Way galaxy. So this is the, the heart of our Milky Way galaxy here billions and billions of stars uh, and so it looks like white steam coming off the top of the teapot so it is, is really an um, apt name for it so being this uh, the direction of the center of our galaxy the milky way uh, as you might expect there are just uh, untold numbers of, of beautiful objects again to see through uh, through a telescope and with Sagittarius at the zenith at the moment there's no better time for them so uh, here are just some of the um, the objects that you might want to have a look for. And again, they're, they're getting um, a little bit trickier there, uh, but um, this is them at their best, so so give it a go. And uh, 
again, we're not going to necessarily be able to see some of the colors, of course, that I've, I've chosen for these images here. That's, uh, that is really quite high spec equipment um, and you want to be tracking that object. So definitely not for a, a Dobsonian by any, uh, by any means, but, uh, but otherwise worth, uh, worth giving a go. All right. So that's over towards the west. It's uh, Western Sky uh, at the moment. And we'll just keep continuing uh, around the sky now and uh, have a look at our South Celestial Pole. So I don't want to talk too much about or linger too much on this part of the sky because obviously we always see these stars. We always see these constellations. So they're going to be covered in basically every guide to the night sky. But um, there are some things that are at their absolute best at the moment. Um, however, we're going to find them by, uh, by using the Southern Cross. So having a look towards the south, you can see Stellarium here has put up the uh, the most common names for these stars that uh, it deems uh, correct. But in all of my years at Stardome, uh, and you know all of the years that I've spent travelling around the world, visiting other planetaria, listening to other shows, uh, and on my holidays, I have absolutely never heard anyone uh, call these stars Rigel, Kentaurus, and Hadar. I, I know that. Uh, of course, Stellarium has always used those names, and also Stardome, the planetarium, will default to those names as well. But I don't know anyone that uses them in, in practice, and this is practical astronomy, so we're just going to write over those names. They're Alpha and Beta Centauri. Okay, commonly known as the two pointers because they will always point towards the top star of the smallest constellation of the sky, the Southern Cross. Okay, um, now in the last uh, meeting of the Astronomical Society I was at, somebody, I heard somebody ask about finding south of the Southern Cross. So just in case um, um, you want a refresher on that, and there are a few ways to do it. I'll just cover it off quickly. Um, but my favourite way, uh, the, I find the way that people remember the best uh, is to use it to draw a line uh, all the way through the sky and way up into Echinar. There. Now, Echinar, people do get nervous about whether they'll be able to find it. Echinar is you know, one of the very brightest stars of the night sky, especially at the moment. It's, it's up really high, very easy to find. So uh, you just look for that one. Um, you can point towards Achenar, point towards the middle of the Southern Cross, bring your hands together until they meet in the middle. And that approximately uh, is uh, the South Celestial Pole or the Southern Pole uh, in, in the sky. Now, a better way and a good way just to double uh, check or reference uh, yourself is uh, to draw a line through the uh, perpendicular, through the middle of the two pointer stars uh, where they would dissect that first line that we made is again the South Celestial Pole and uh, so straight down from there should be uh, south. Now it's not perfectly south, uh, but um, it is um, it is pretty close. Okay, so what is um, what is next? So oh, sorry, just uh, lost control of my. I screen it. That's okay. Okay. So um, here we go. So staying in that same part of the sky, uh, we've got um, two things which are um, up quite high um, and uh, are worth having a look for. So they're best. The Southern Cross is at its lowest point, so uh, it's a little bit harder to see than than usual. In fact, it's going to, of course, con uh, continue on its way around in a, in a big circle. Well, it does that every 24 hours, but uh, for the early evening sky, it's going to be really down low here around the south uh, between uh, late October, November, and really, really hard to see. And so for that reason, the jewel box oh, thanks. Um, it's going to be really hard to see um, um, the jewel box open cluster. Um, and actually, I'm not going to talk too much about open clusters, but um, if anyone is um, 
uh, interested in finding out more about open clusters, then uh, do have a look at Chris's uh, Stardom talk from the 6th of uh, September. Uh, it's a, a really, really good talk and, and covers off all the different types of clusters that are in the sky at the moment. But uh, up here we've got our two galaxies. So we've got the Magellanic uh, Cloud. So uh, we've got the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is easily found, found uh, by sort of looking in between Achenar and Canopus and in between there. And, okay. and then we have got the um, small Magellanic Cloud, which is on the other side of that line. So um, really, really easy uh, to, to spot when they're up nice and high like this. All right. Okay, and then last off, I thought that looking over uh, towards this direction, we have a look uh, for uh, at these same stars, but in a slightly different way. So I've really zoomed out now so that you can see uh, towards the south. Uh, we have Te Waka o and uh, this is um, as looking at a great big waka in the sky uh, that was said to be the way that, um, according to Māori, that uh, all of the stars of the Milky Way galaxy uh, were seeded uh, into the sky. And so what we're looking for uh, is a, is a uh, great big waka that starts uh, here, actually with the tail of the scorpion, which uh, we saw earlier, um, comes along here down to Titora, uh, which is the, the two pointer stars, to Te Punga, the Southern Cross, and then across, and then ends up here at uh, at Orion. Okay, so um, to see the sub that uh, that great big walker can be a bit tricky. I've tried to make it a little bit easier here by uh, copying one of the the images uh, here from Dr. Rangi Matamua. Uh, but um, uh, here you can see uh, if you, you look down. Uh, you can see that curl of stars that makes uh, the uh, the front of the big boat and then down to uh, the anchor. Um, going straight up, we have Akana, uh, which is uh, the top of the sail. And then it comes down to Canopus or Atutahi, the second brightest star in the sky, and then Orion making up the, the back. Uh, of of our great big walker. Okay, so this this image comes from one of the the shows at Stardom. If you haven't seen it, Nafito um, Matariki, I highly recommend. It's not showing at the at the moment, of course. Uh, now that we've come out of the season of Matariki, but if you haven't, it is worth having a look at. Uh, and then seeing all the ways that Indigenous people saw these stars, particularly over towards the south. All right, so. There we go. That's uh, that is it uh, for me. That's uh, a look at the spring night sky. Thank you again for having me. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, let me know. Thank you for that, Melody. That was a great presentation. We actually don't have any questions on the chat. I mean, we can uh, hang around for another thirty seconds or so. Oh, we do have one. Just one come in. Um, it says. You mentioned Saturn's rings disappearing. What exactly is happening to them? Oh, okay. So what's happening to them uh, is, unfortunately, I can't show you uh, this uh, in here so uh, on Sturium so easily, but um, um, what's happening is that those rings, as I say, they're 300,000 kilometres across, but they're 80 metres deep. And so when uh, Saturn and, and Earth are uh, sort of above or below each other, uh, we get this lovely view of them sort of side uh, side on. So we, we can see some of those rings. Uh, but when um, you get a, um, uh, when Saturn and, uh, and Earth uh, become on the same plane, so they're on the same level and we're looking st straight on or edge onto those those rings, they are so thin at 80 metres, there's just no way that we can, uh, we can see them at all. Now, if we were at Stardome, I'll try not to say that too much. If we were at Stardome, uh, I would try to, uh, you know, take you to those rings and you'd fly through them and just see how thin they are. Um, but um, but it's okay, they're still there, and um, um, and they will be for three hundred million years. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, they they'll just take a few weeks to for Earth to to move on in its uh, orbit around the sun, and, and for our perspective to change, and they they come back into into view. And 
the same person says, ah, in 300,000 years, if that's what it was, why will they disappear completely? But I think you might have just covered that. Oh, well, they, sorry, I did mention, um, so 300 million years, they will disappear completely. Uh, so basically, so what will happen um, is to a certain extent, they will um, they will just lose their shine. So they will get dusty uh, and uh, not be quite so, so brilliant um, as they are now. So they're, they're thought to be relatively fresh or new so um and and nice and icy and bright so we can see them really really nicely but what will happen over time is they they basically become dusty and duller and we won't see them so well and then also some of the smaller objects um will sort of lose their um will lose their position uh, and they will uh, there not be so many um items or so many individual objects in the rings uh, for, for us actually uh, to view. So, for example, um, it's thought that probably Jupiter, um, well, Jupiter does have rings still, but it's thought that those would have once been fresh and bright and new and, and easily seen for us here on Earth. And then over time, those have disintegrated and we don't see them anymore. So that should happen uh, to, um, uh, to Saturn. Um, I, I really like as a theory, and um, I, I don't know quite how accurate this is, but um, I, I have heard reports of, of some uh, astronomers believing that uh, perhaps one of Mars's moons uh, will uh, disintegrate and um, then it will produce rings of, of Mars. Now, we won't be around for that, unfortunately, but um, that would um, uh, that would maybe make up for, for Saturn's loss. Thanks for that, Melanie. I've, I've learned something as well, which is great. Um, there aren't any more questions, so um, I guess all that remains is me to say thank you very much. Um, really appreciate your time, and it was a fantastic talk. Great. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Night.